Welcome, I'm Katherine Hadro, and this is EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Our first subject is the Supreme Court. I think that uh, she will be outstanding. She's going to be uh, as good as anybody that has served on that court. The thing that should happen is we should wait. We should wait and see what the outcome of this election is, because that's the only way the American people get to express their view. Debate standoff. The gloves come off as the two men vying to win next month's presidential election spar about the Supreme Court nomination of Judge Amy Coney Barrett. An insider's perspective on Barrett from a former law student. The judge's legal scholarship, her mentorship, and her compassion towards this Notre Dame alum with special needs. And surviving an abortion, a story you will never forget from a woman who lived while her twin died. What she thinks about the president's born alive executive order. President Donald Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden faced off this week in a presidential debate like no other. The contentious debate was the first time the two presidential nominees met on the stage, and the first question out of the gate was about the Supreme Court and Judge Amy Coney Barrett. He never keeps his word. Can you add no, back, no, 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 I'm not asking. That, that was a rhetorical question. Himself. All right, we're, uh, gentlemen, we're, we, which no, was heavily Mr. President, you would have been president, much later, Joe. Mr. President, much later. Mr. President, You're talking about in a night that's being described as chaotic and unusually bitter, the two presidential nominees debated for the first time this week on a Cleveland stage moderated by Fox's Chris Wallace. And what often felt more like sparring than debating, the interruptions were frequent, and the opportunity to get a point across rare. Uh, Gentlemen, we, you say that's the end Chris, of it? This is the I end of this debate. Honest ballot count. We're going to leave it there too. Uh, I, to be continued. Throughout the 90-minute event, there was no direct question about abortion, but Wallace did open the debate with a topic that could directly impact its laws, the Supreme Court. President Trump, you nominated Amy Coney Barrett over the weekend to succeed the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the court. You say the Constitution is clear about your obligation and the Senate's to consider a nominee to the court. Vice President Biden, you say that this is an effort by the president and Republicans to jam through an appointment and what you call an abuse of power. Where do you think a Justice Barrett would take the court? We have a phenomenal nominee, respected by all, top, top academic, uh, Good in every way, good in every way. The justice, and I have nothing, I'm not opposed to the justice. She seems like a very fine person. But she's written before she went on the bench, which is her right, that she thinks that the Affordable Care Act is not constitutional. And while it did not get much airtime, the nominees did raise the issue of Roe. The president also is opposed to Roe v. Wade. That's on the ballot as well in the court, in the court. It's a topic that's sure to get a lot more attention the remainder of the 2020 campaign as Amy Coney Barrett's nomination to the Supreme Court moves ahead with Senate confirmation hearings later this month. The president has asked me to become the ninth justice. And as it happens, I'm used to being in a group of nine, my family. If confirmed, pro-lifers and abortion advocates alike believe the Supreme Court is better poised to overturn or pick away at Roe v. Wade. One of the senators sitting on the Senate Judiciary Committee who will question Barrett's nomination is Kamala Harris of California, the Democratic vice presidential nominee who will face off against Vice President Mike Pence in a debate next week. For pro-life debate analysis, we're joined now via Skype by Marjorie Dannenfelser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List and co-chair of Pro-Life Voices for Trump, and Alexandra DeSanctis, a staff writer for National Review. Welcome back to you both. There was not a direct question about abortion at the first presidential debate, but there was this exchange about Roe versus Wade and Amy Coney Barrett. Take a listen. The president also is opposed to Roe v. Wade. That's on the ballot as well in the court, in the court. And so that's also at stake right now. 
And so the election is all You don't know it's begun. on the ballot. I, Why is it in the ballot? Because, because Why is you it on the ballot? It's not on the ballot. It's on the ballot in the I court. I don't think so. In the court. Well, There's nothing happening there. Donald, would you and just you don't know her me? view on Roe v. Wade. You I don't, don't know, know her view. Marjorie, what is the president saying there? He's saying that um, he is not in a position, and he shouldn't be, in prejudicing any case that might come her way. We would not want him to put her in that position, and we uh, won't expect her to put herself in that position when she's being questioned in a hearing room about what, how she might rule on a case. It would just be wrong for him to do that. I think we know he's extremely pro-life. He's committed to uh, uh, nominating pro-life um, Supreme Court justices, and we hope that that has happened here. Indications seem good. But I think he was right to not go for the, you know, this is the anti-Roe candidate. Alexandra, Joe Biden was asked whether or not he would pack the courts if elected, and he <clears throat> did not directly answer that question. Can you explain this issue of packing the courts, Alexandra, and its significance in this election? Sure. So this is something that the Democratic uh, politicians have been pushing now for a couple of years, saying if we're not able to get the policies that we want, if there's you know, too many Republicans in the Senate, for instance, um, or there's uh, you know, justices on the court who aren't going to reinterpret the Constitution so that we can uh, get our policy preferences put in place, we'll just add more justices. And this is something that Franklin Roosevelt tried to do unsuccessfully. Um, it's possible. It's not you know, prohibited in the Constitution. But Clearly, this is a, would be a pretty radical move. And, and the fact that Joe Biden both refused to answer and, and got away with not answering that question, um, given that so many high-profile Democrats are, are pushing for it, I think is um, kind of a disgrace. Marjorie, what if Biden were elected and packed the courts? Can you explain the potential impact on pro-life laws? Yeah, the, well, the first thing that would happen is, <clears throat> is that they, there's no reason that they can't do that. All you need is a majority in the House and the Senate and the president signs it so they could uh, change because they would change the um, legislative filibuster. So they could pass that as a rule. Um, then they would um, add new uh, court justices. Um, that would mean that um, that they would be very freed up to start. Um, I think their first move would be to uh, enshrine Roe versus Wade in the law first. They would pass a national law that basically reflects or goes further than Roe versus Wade goes, knowing that any case that comes, the, the court would probably not hear because of the uh, because of the other two. So it would set us back. I mean, in fact, it, I wouldn't even say it'll set us back. It might mean that we never get a shot, ever get a shot at restoring the Constitution and restoring the principles that the founders uh, uh, fought so hard to preserve. I don't. I, I think that's certainly possible. And a lot of people have said, no, you know, that Roosevelt he tried that so long ago. But well, we're living in a different age. There were a lot of assumptions shared back then, and we weren't living in quite the polarized atmosphere. We are living in a polarized mm -hmm. place. And the ends in this group justify the means. Uh, I absolutely believe they will do that, and it would be an extreme thing to do. And I don't think they do it with any apologies. Mm -hmm. Alexandra, in the 2016 presidential election, the abortion question did not come up until the end of the third and final presidential debate between Trump and Clinton. It was not directly raised in this first 2020 presidential debate, as we mentioned, though maybe Chris Wallace was trying to get there. Alexandra, are you expecting the abortion issue will be more prominent in the remaining debates? You know, I, to be honest, I'm pretty used to abortion not being raised in debates at all. And, you know, we watched all the, the Democratic primary debates. It hardly ever came up. And I think um, just from what I've seen of, of the kind of the mainstream media or, or the media atmosphere, um, more broadly, you just don't really see people talking about abortion very often. I guess it's, it's been more in the news lately with talk of Roe possibly being overturned and different state laws on abortion. Um, but from what I've seen, I think they, they tend to avoid it or they'll have kind of a, a passing question here or there. Mm -hmm. I would love to see it raised in the debate. I hope it comes up. And I think probably the media thinks it's an issue that would, um, would help Joe Biden, if anything. So maybe that'll encourage them to bring it up. But I do think that's something President Trump was very strong on in 2016. Mm -hmm. Marjorie, you were just at the White House when President Trump formally nominated Judge Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. As a pro-life leader, what are your thoughts about a potential Justice Barrett? Well, I think, uh, I think you know, for the work that the Susan B. Anthony List has done, uh, which is just a reflection of a need for great, strong women leaders like Alexandra at you, um, who, are, who are acting in public life, doing what they do best, um, it is an incredible moment to see a justice like her 
who will have conflicting opinions with other women on the court. Also, it's a beautiful thing to see her replacing uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg because of their, uh, while they uh, both have, they honor the law, they certainly see um, abortion law, and I would hope in a very different way. It is truly a victory for the pro-life movement that decided to put muscle at the center of it um, and, and really be serious and take itself seriously as a, as a take no prisoners in politics type of um, type of work because babies like babies deserve this strength as uh, as more than guns do, more than tobacco does, more than any other lobbying group does. I think this is an extension of that because we have a pro-life president and we have a pro-life Senate and therefore we get to name and confirm the justices. Alexandra Barrett is a former Notre Dame professor. You're a Notre Dame alum yourself. Uh, briefly, what have you made of the media reaction to Barrett's appointment to the high court? I honestly think it's just been horrifying to watch. The, all the initial reports were about uh, her membership in People of Praise, which is this Christian lay group. You know, they essentially get together for Bible study or for service, things like this. Very innocuous, kind of, they believe common uh, Christian dogma and doctrine. And yet it's been, you know, trashed as being like Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale and misogynistic and, and women have to be submissive. Um, all these sorts of lies about trying to paint her as some kind of extremist. Uh, there's been hardly any coverage of the types of things that you know deserve to be covered right now, which are her you know outstanding career as a, a professor, her you know uh, her time as a jurist, her jurisprudence. Um, all that has been essentially glossed over to try and make her look like some kind of you know crazy uh, theocrat and saying that she's going to overturn Roe because she's a Catholic, which I find just shameful. Mm. Thank you both for being here, Marjorie Dannon Felster and Alexandra DeSanctis. Thank you. Thanks. This week, Judge Amy Coney Barrett met with senators on Capitol Hill ahead of her confirmation hearings. President Trump appointed Barrett, a Catholic mother of seven and former Notre Dame law professor, to replace the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the Supreme Court. This is a pivotal moment in the history of the pro-life movement, as Barrett is a constitutionalist whom pro-lifers believe will uphold the right to life. That brings us to this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and write to your senators to confirm Amy Coney Barrett. Having Barrett on the Supreme Court bench could have a major impact on the pro-life cause for decades to come. At our website, we've drafted letters that you can directly send to your senators. You can, of course, change the wording to whatever you would like. Let's encourage our senators to swiftly confirm Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. Write to your senators by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. One of Amy Coney Barrett's former law students who went on to become the first blind woman to clerk on the Supreme Court is now sharing her personal and powerful perspective about the judge everyone is talking about. Former Notre Dame law student Laura Wolk wrote a First Things article last week entitled What I Learned from Amy Coney Barrett. Wolk, who is completely blind, says when her assistive technology did not arrive in time for the start of her law school career, she turned to then law professor Barrett for help, believing Barrett could counsel her on how to have Notre Dame University obtain the technology as quickly as possible. Wolk writes, but she did not merely help me to readjust the burden on my own shoulders. She took it from me and carried it herself. I will never forget the moment when she looked at me from across her desk and said coolly and matter of factly, Laura, this is not your problem anymore, it's mine. Laura Wolk, a former Notre Dame law student of Judge Amy Coney Barrett and the first blind woman to clerk on the Supreme Court, joins us now via Skype. Laura, welcome. You wrote movingly about then-Professor Barrett's impact on your personal and professional life. Can you share with our viewers more details about how Professor Barrett was a mentor to you and what that meant to you? Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. So. As you know, you mentioned that the very first time that I had experience with Professor Barrett, but that was the beginning of a now seven year long mentorship and relationship where time and again, um, Professor Barrett has just been a total champion for me. And, um, you know, I think as a woman in the law, it, it can be a, a, an isolating place sometimes. For me, having a disability on top of that, um, it is rarely the case that I have someone that I can look to who has done the things that I have done um, or want to do um, and can give me guidance. And even though Professor Barrett uh, does, is not blind herself, 
Judge Barrett. Um, I still need to transition into saying mm -hmm. that. Um, she has such a compassionate and empathic heart. It doesn't matter what the challenge is that her student or her colleague is facing. She is able to um, enter into those experiences with the person. So just as life happens, you know, when I've been moving and feeling overwhelmed or starting a new job or when I went to the court and I um, struggled in the beginning with wondering whether I it was I belonged there. Um, Judge Barrett has just always been someone that I know will tell me the truth, and someone who I can go to for both advice, but also um, like the pep talks when you need the pep talks. Mm. And uh, it's it's that it's that combination of both the practical and the empathic that makes her such an amazing friend and mentor. Mm. And Laura, you are a trailblazer in your own right. Can you speak to the importance of having an advocate as you have, you know, both as a woman and as a person who has a disability? Yes, I there. It's so important. I mean, this is advice I give to young uh, women and, and blind people all of the time. I mean, like we the church talks about this, like human beings, we are meant to be interdependent. We are not supposed to carry everything uh, on our own and we're not meant to do, we're not meant to live this journey on our own. And so having an advocate not only is, it's beneficial for both parties. It's, it's helpful to me as the mentee because I'm receiving very practical assistance, but it's also beneficial for the person who is doing the advocating um, because it's through those types of relationships that I think we really come to understand the importance of, of uh, really seeing the person as a human in their full humanity and everything they have to offer. Um, and so for me, it's like, you know, it's not just, like I was saying earlier, it's not just the practical help. It's, it's the fact that you know that someone else is walking this journey with you. And so when you fail, um, you have people to help you up and start again. And when you succeed, I mean, when I got my clerkship on the Supreme Court, one of the best parts of it was that I knew it was not my own success. It mm -hmm. was the success of many people. And um, when I called them to share the news and, and, and Professor Barrett among them, their, um, their happiness was, was very genuine because they had played a role and it was partially their success mm -hmm. as well. Laura, there's a lot of media interest surrounding the fact that Judge Barrett is a mother of seven. Uh, speaking as one of her former students, did the size of Amy Coney Barrett's family ever stifle her ability to do her job well? And what do you make of the scrutiny facing her family size? Yeah, I I think the the harping on the size of her family is it's not just uh, irrelevant; it's actually really offensive. Um, it sends a message that. Uh, women should live a particular way and it is only proper for them to do um, to fulfill certain roles and I just think that it sends an absolutely terrible message to women um, everywhere to say that if, if you want to be a certain type of successful person um, you cannot have a large family and you know no I don't it absolutely did not stifle and it, it, it only made us appreciate her more because um, Notre Dame is very wonderful in this way, the law school. Um, professors are encouraged to speak about their family life. We learned a lot about the families of our professors in the classroom, not just Professor Barrett, but many of my professors. And so I think that's a beautiful witness. It's, it's, it's not this idea that, especially for women, when you're in the professional realm, you pretend like you don't have a family, you don't talk about them, because what, what if people think, oh gosh, she must be so busy. Um, you joyfully talk about your family. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's one you know, anecdote that I think speaks volumes to Professor Barrett at, that relating to the technology uh, issue that I wrote about, which is that uh, she followed up with me at a tailgate before a Notre Dame football game. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember her coming up to me and she was holding one of her children like in her arms and another one of her little girls was, you know, crawling around in the grass and she's talking to me and she's like telling me about what she's done so far and asking me how I'm doing in the, at the same time, she's, you know, telling her little daughter to put her shoes on and she's, you know, mm. giving her other daughter a snack. Right. right. And it's, so it's like, Here's this you, woman that I'm just totally yeah. in awe of. Yeah. And you can multitask. You know, you can multitask. Laura, well, thank you so much for your witness and for taking the time to come on this week. Thanks so much. Thank you. 
Still to come on EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, an unforgettable story. She survived the abortion that killed her twin. Her take on the president's Born Alive executive order. We are the Pro-Life Generation! We are the Pro-Life Generation! And on camera, the rising tensions between those who support and those who denounce the nomination of Judge Amy Coney Barrett. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. An abortion activist punched a young pro-life woman in the face at a Supreme Court rally. That is this week's Speak Out segment. 23-year-old pro-lifer Autumn Shimmer started her new role with Students for Life Action just last week. Days later, during her first week on the new job, an abortion activist punched her in the face on the steps of the Supreme Court as she rallied in support of Judge Amy Coney Barrett's nomination. Take a look at this. Abortion kills a human person! Abortion kills a human person! Abortion kills a human person! Okay, all right, she just got hit in the face. Can we have an officer? Who hit you? Who hit you? NARAL held the Sunday pro-abortion rally in opposition to Barrett's nomination to the Supreme Court. Shimmer showed up to the rally in support of Barrett when she says an abortion activist walked up to her and asked if she'd like to have a peaceful conversation about feminism. Shimmer says she agreed to it, but after the conversation became tense, removed herself from the situation. That's when she says the abortion activist then punched her in the face and then fled into the crowd. The woman who punched the pro-lifer was located by police and arrested. I had the chance to speak with Autumn Shimmer about this unsettling incident. The young Catholic woman says getting punched in the face was shocking and upsetting, and she believes it's evil on full display. Something that Shimmer told me. She had just received Holy Communion just hours before the incident, and in her pocket was carrying a rosary from Lourdes that was blessed by St. John Paul II. The Students for Life Action employee told me on the phone that the violence of abortion has breeded the culture of violence in our society. But at the end of the day, the violence she faces will never surmount to the violence babies who are aborted face in the womb. This incident is a clear example of the culture of death as we draw closer now to Election Day and Amy Coney Barrett's Senate confirmation hearings. The national debate over abortion is sure to get only more intense in our nation but we can never allow it to rise to the level of violence. Let us all pray for peace in our nation, pray for peace in our own hearts, and pray that the truth on life will ring loudly for us all. President Trump has signed a Born Alive executive order. The announcement first came in a recorded message during last week's National Catholic Prayer Breakfast. I will always defend the sacred right to life. Today, I am announcing that I will be signing the Born Alive executive order to ensure that all precious babies born alive, no matter their circumstances, receive the medical care that they deserve. President Trump signed the executive order called Protecting Vulnerable Newborn and Infant Children on Friday. The order requires medical care for all babies born alive and prevents discrimination from medical treatment, including infants who are premature or who are born with disabilities. For this week's pro life Focus and reaction to this major news, we're joined now via Skype by an abortion survivor, Claire Colwell. Claire, welcome. For viewers who are meeting you for the first time, can you give us a brief introduction to your powerful story? And did you face any medical complications as a result of surviving an abortion? Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm from Austin, Texas. My husband and I live here with our children. And 10 years ago, I learned after meeting my birth mother that I am the surviving twin of a botched D&E dismemberment abortion um, that successfully aborted my twin. Uh, when I found this out, I learned that there are tens of thousands of individuals who share a similar story to mine of being hurt by abortion, a similar story to my birth mother's, and that I am not alone in being an abortion survivor. Uh, what I realized was there, there was a name and a face and a story with that unborn child, with that woman who's contemplating, contemplating an abortion. And 
that every single person should be given the chance um, to be born, regardless of circumstance, regardless of gestational age. I was born 10 weeks premature. I had a dislocated hip and I had club feet. Uh, what's miraculous is those abortion instruments didn't touch my body as those complications I have experienced are common complications that twins experience. But what I've uh, learned as I've connected with other survivors, I'm in this community of survivors called the Abortion Survivors Network, is that every single one of us um, as survivors has experienced some type of trauma from the abortion procedure that tried to end our life, whether it be physical, emotional, or other types of bodily harm uh, from that abortion experience. And so it is very real. Um, and, and babies are surviving. There are survivors of all all age ranges, all demographics, and every single one of them mm. is a human being deserving of a chance at life and at medical care. Wow, Claire, I have chills. Thank you so much for bravely sharing your witness. Uh, that being said, as someone who has survived an abortion, what was your reaction when you learned that President Trump signed the Born Alive executive order? I think it's incredible. I, I know for me, just from my experience, I felt so thankful. I felt heard and I felt seen for the first time in a long time by somebody who is using his authority to the best of his ability to deliver on what he's promised the American people. And that is to value, to protect, to uphold the right to life. And so I was encouraged um, as he is protecting and honoring our Constitution that gives us the right to life, regardless of circumstance or gestational age. That is so powerful. Claire, thank you so much again for sharing your witness. I hope to have you on again soon to, to speak more with you and to share more of, of, of your beautiful life. Claire Colwell, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Until next time, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. You can also send us a message by emailing prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. We'd love to hear from you. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.